that the Bureau of Land Management administers today are largely a consequence of the disposal policies of the previous century. After 1900, Congress continued its disposal policy, but also increasingly looked toward retention and conservation and stewardship of what remained of our nation's vast landed estate. It was under Theodore Roosevelt that the conservation movement began to take shape. With his advisors, Gifford Pinchot, head of the newly created Forest Service, and James R. Garfield, who became his Secretary of the Interior in 1907, Roosevelt formulated a conservation policy for the federal lands. The principles which govern the conservation movement, like all great and effective things, are simple and easily understood. It stands for development and provisions for the future. Conservation means the greatest good to the greatest number for the longest time. The earth and its resources belong of right to its people. The nation's forests were the first conservation issue. Passage of the 1891 Reform Act brought the forest reserve system into being. At first, administration was under the General Land Office. Then in 1905, responsibility was transferred to the Department of Agriculture and a new bureau, the Forest Service. Aside from the forests, Roosevelt and his cabinet took a look at the public domain's mineral resources in the light of the new conservation ethic. Many mineral resources were being monopolized by large corporations. Of these, coal particularly was of concern to the emerging industrial nation. By 1906, fraught with numerous coal land frauds, Teddy Roosevelt made a drastic shift in mineral policy. In July 1906, he began the systematic withdrawal of millions of acres of lands thought to have high coal values. Classification of public lands was initially structured for sale at fair market value. Then, dissatisfied with the sale program, Roosevelt pushed for adoption of a leasing policy. At first, Congress resisted the idea of leasing. Then in 1920, Congress legislated for the leasing of coal, petroleum, and other minerals on the classified public lands. Out of the withdrawal and classification of public lands with mineral values came a major conflict. Many of these lands also had high surface values. A means was needed to make these lands available for settlement while withdrawing the subsurface mineral estate. Thus arose the concept of split estate, the separation of surface ownership from subsurface mineral rights. Laws recognizing split estate came in rapid succession. Coal in 1909 and 1910, petroleum and other minerals in 1914. In 1916, with passage of the Stock Raising Homestead Act, Congress provided for the reservation of all minerals to the United States. The idea of reserving minerals to the United States originated with Teddy Roosevelt. Our mineral resources are limited and cannot be increased or reproduced. The coal, oil, gas, and phosphate rights still remaining should be withdrawn from entry. At the time split estate was thought of, it was the perfect conservation ideal. It allowed the lands on the surface to go into agricultural production, while at the same time reserving valuable mineral resources that could be used in the future. However, today, it poses one of the most complex problems that the Bureau of Land Management has to deal with. The conservation movement under Teddy Roosevelt also turned its attention to water, as evidenced here by Roosevelt Dam in central Arizona. Water always had been in high demand in the West. 
The value of water for power generation also was recognized in the Roosevelt years. Congress took an active concern in protecting sites with power or reservoir potential. A massive program of withdrawals of power sites began to protect against speculators and monopolies and to retain development for the public good. Aside from water for power, water for agriculture remained a highly charged issue. Often he who controlled the water controlled the land. Homesteading expanded rapidly with the new conservation era. Teddy Roosevelt's interior secretary, James R. Garfield. Our public land policy has for its aim the use of the public land so that it will promote local development by the settlement of homemakers. From the Roosevelt administration's commitment to settlement, there emerged new homestead laws. Irrigation projects funded by private interests had only a smattering of success. It took too much capital. State water initiatives funded under the 1894 Cary Land Act also had limited success. But in 1902, Congress launched a major effort at reclaiming the arid west. 160 acres was available to anyone who could put water on the land. Congress also turned its attention to the semi-arid uplands. In 1909, 320 acres of dry land were allowed for entry. In 1916, lands were provided for stock-raising homesteads. Entries could be made for a full section of land, or 640 acres. The result? More homesteads were patented after the turn of the century than before. The cattle empire of the West had toppled. The vast holdings now were broken up. Fierce competition forced the issue of federal stewardship of the public domain. As a result of this concern for their, for their own interests, as early as 1899, the National uh, Cattlemen's Association began to ask Congress to pass legislation calling for the leasing of the public domain for grazing purposes. This proposal, however, was not met with enthusiasm by everybody. Small cattlemen, and also small sheepmen, feared the fact that the range would be leased mainly to large cattlemen, and therefore exclude them from being able to make a living on the public range. Here in southeastern Montana along Pumpkin Creek, many of the forces that were impacting cattlemen were occurring here. There was overcrowding, overgrazing, and there was a fractionalized land pattern. However, here, unlike many parts of the West, the land pattern was further complicated, not only by ranchers who owned land, scattered lands owned by the federal government, and those lands abandoned by homesteaders, but there were also lands owned by the Northern Pacific Railway as a part of their land grant given to them by Congress in 1864. One of the ranchers in this area that was very concerned about the problems of overgrazing and overcrowding was William Tahn, and it was largely through some of his efforts that the Mazpah Pumpkin Creek Grazing District was organized. My dad, William Tahn, uh, he's the one that got the idea of starting this thing. He fenced a six-section pasture, and uh, there was a fellow that uh, in the State College at Bozeman, a guy by the name of Mont Saunderson and M. L. Wilson. My dad and these two men were friends, and Mont come out and run a grass survey on this six-section pasture. So when they started about how many cattle they were going to run, my dad told them, you know, he said it's not going to run anywhere near what you people think. And he had the figures to show them because every animal that went in that six section pasture was counted when it was taken out and everything. 
And this was really when it all worked out. And he found out also the longer uh, he took care of this six section pasture, the more cattle it would run. And the man that you least hear of that should have gotten credit for a whole lot was a man that was the head of the Custer National Forest here, a man by the name of Alva Simpson, mm -hmm. who was a real close friend of my dad's. They had to get this thing out of Congress. And the first year, uh, it was turned down. The man that was instrumental in getting it turned down was a man by the name of Thomas Waltz that was our senator. He said, well, I'll come out and see for myself. So he called a meeting. But when the meeting was over, Waltz told my dad, he says, the thing will go, because he said, I'll get behind it. And it did. And the land was taken out of the homestead entry, and the Mespa started in uh, 1928. And the federal government gave these people a lease, a 10-year lease that was renewable. They wanted to have the right that if it was overgrazed or in any way damaged from grazing by erosion or that, that they could step in. They never had to use that because every time they come out and looked it over, they thought that the land had advanced in grazing. And when it first was used, they almost doubled the carrying capacity. All these efforts began to bear fruit by 1931. In that year, drought hit eastern Montana. Many ranchers were forced off the range by midsummer. However, the members of the Mespaw Pumpkin Creek Grazing District were able to keep their cattle on the range until the late fall. This event came to the notice of many individuals throughout the West. Stockman journals and others brought this to the attention of Stockman. A greater interest began to be taken in the Mespaw Pumpkin Creek Grazing District. In hearings before Congress, both grazing men and government officials brought forth the fact that the Mespaw Pumpkin Creek Grazing District had been very successful. And it was this fact, combined with other factors, that helped Congress finally pass the Taylor Grazing Act on June 28, 1934. The Division of Grazing was the first grazing organization in the interior pursuant to the Taylor Grazing Act, and, and it was headed up uh, by the new director, Farrington Carpenter, or Ferry Carpenter as he is known as. He was a rancher and an attorney from western Colorado, from Hayden. The Taylor Grazing Act said the government would sell the isolated tracks, lease tracks that were not big enough to go into districts, and then they would set up grazing districts for the rest of the public domain. That's about all they said. They wrote Feeney to it, passed it, Roosevelt signed it, and there it was. Ferry had to start out with 19 people. Uh, most of those people recruited from the General Land Office in the Geological Survey. Two of them were range specialists that he stole away from the Forest Service. He started out with a budget of $150,000. They put the crown on me and said, go out there and set those grazing districts up. So here was the job, gentlemen, and here were 142 million acres of land. And the stockman would ask, fee? What kind of fee? We've always grazed for nothing. I said, boys, the Congress has let you have it for as long as you could for nothing. And now they've got a collar, and you've got to stick your head through it. If you don't, another fellow will, and we'll please him, and let him have the range. When I first started work, I guess that was a, probably had a reputation of being one of the worst areas as far as ranchers. I mean, in government and BLM, of course, they, they would uh, pull guns on you, and they hit a few BLM people and so forth. One funny thing I found was that the drier the land is, and the more worthless it is, 
the harder stockmen fight for it. Just why that is, I don't know, but they do. I have had them fight over land on which 640 acres wouldn't support a night crawler. They'd fight over that until grim death. These were a bouncy bunch of boys, these stockmen. I come on board in 1953 and was uh, part of the, the tail end of the GI Bill graduates from the uh, land-grant colleges who went into resource management. I went that direction uh, instead of being continuing my career as a cowpuncher because uh, cowpunching didn't even pay the, the bill to the saddle stores and furthermore there wasn't room on the ranch where I was raised to for one more family to, to uh, exist. Earlier they were more or less used to doing it the way they pleased and so that was a, a little tougher period to go through get them you know that we were exerting a little more control tell them how many cattle and when they could use the pasture. As I put in my first month or six weeks in Shoshone, I kept hearing this word adjudication. Now, uh, adjudication doesn't show up in the San Pete County Dictionary, and, and so I was to learn later on in a, a conference that they had with the regional office people in Shoshone that adjudication really equals cut. In the earlier days, uh, we would have a lot of protest means through the advisory board. We worked through the advisory boards pretty much, and uh, we had a lot of battles, you know, uh, a lot of meetings that lasted two or three days. Then the fun began. We finally set a role of commensurability. The man who could feed his stock when the public range was not used would get first crack at the public range. We had every imaginable kind of commensurability, including water rights, and we respected prior rights or previous use of the range. And that took some hammering out. We learned to live by compromise. Timber in the Pacific Northwest was also a concern. In 1866, Congress had granted lands to the Oregon and California Railroad Company. However, the railroad did not fulfill the provisions of the act, and in 1916, Congress took back title to the land grant, one of the richest timber areas in the West. The politics of the day locked out Forest Service management of these lands, and they remained under the General Land Office. This 1937 legislation was to have a significant effect on the future Bureau of Land Management. And Oregon was a big timber country, and for a forester it was like being a, a kid in the candy store. When we started out, timber was, uh, was king. We had tremendous stands of the finest Douglas fir in the world, and uh, because of the receipt uh, systems that were used in, in collecting monies and re returning them to the counties, uh, we didn't have much political. Uh, flack. We didn't have many problems. We could do almost what we wanted to. And essentially, we disregarded every other resource, but possibly soil and, and the trees. But towards the end of that decade, we began to see that there were other things that had to be considered. The 1930s brought change to American agricultural policy. Drought and the Great Depression devastated the farmers of the arid west. The Dust Bowl soon forced retreat of farmers who had settled the public lands in the previous decades. Agricultural experts had to come to grips with the problem facing western farmers. To many, the solution was taking submarginal lands out of crop production and restoring them to rangeland use. Under the New Deal administration of Franklin Delano Roosevelt, 
the Department of Agriculture began to establish land utilization projects for the purpose of buying submarginal crop lands. The acquired lands were to be administered by the federal government, and attempts were made to block these lands with public lands for effective management. The idea was to relocate people, so the government came in and purchased the, the lands and then tried to relocate them to irrigation units. In the 1950s, a number of the land utilization projects were transferred to the BLM. And uh, we handled it uh, under a special rule, re-adjudicated it, re-surveyed re it, and allocated it. The government reseeded all the farmland, so we've got quite a bit of crested wheat. The LU lands that remained with the Department of Agriculture eventually became known as the National Grasslands. Therefore, the land utilization program further fractured the land pattern of the West. Barry Carpenter served as head of the grazing division until 1939. At that time, an interior department reorganization retired the division and created the grazing service under Richard Rutledge. A veteran of Forest Service range adjudications, Rutledge proposed a hike in the five cent AUM grazing fee, and the fight was on. Nevada Senator Pat McCarran led the charge, backed by input from outraged stockmen. McCarran carried the fight to Congress, where he attempted to quash the fee hike, cut the grazing service budget, and muster support for disposal of public lands. The grazing service found themselves between a rock and a hard place at that point in time with, with Pat McCarran on the Interior Committee saying, if you raise the grazing fees, uh, I'm going to have your hide. You're not going to get an appropriation. On the other hand, the House Appropriation Committee was saying, uh, if you don't get those grazing fees up to, to cover the increased costs, uh, then you're not going to get an appropriation. While the grazing service had fallen on hard times, for the general land office, things had been going awry from early in the new century. The general land office employees saw the handwriting on the wall. Uh, they saw uh, the availability of land for conveyance starting to diminish, even though there's, there's a many hundreds of millions of acres left. They apparently started to institutionalize uh, procedure to the point that, uh, that it almost brought conveyances to a, a standstill by 1946. Example, uh, every land case made at least three tr round trips through the Washington office. The director and the assistant director uh, either had to sign any piece of mail regarding one of those case files. By 1946, in the words of analyst Paul Colhane, the grazing service and the general land office were taken out behind the barn and mercifully put out of their misery. In 1946, through executive reorganization and without mandate from Congress, President Harry Truman merged the general land office and the grazing service. The new orphan organization was placed within the Department of the Interior. Its name, the Bureau of Land Management. grazing service and the general land office was not without its problems. Conflicting philosophies of stewardship and land disposal caused many sparks to fly. Also, many of the old general land office employees jealously guarded their knowledge as job security. So here you have on one hand people who still want to convey land and, and feel that is a, still a mandate. There's 3,000 plus disposal laws on the books yet, and you have the grazing service employees who come along on the other hand who are looking at uh, the actual management of the, uh, 
the soil vegetation uh, uh, resources out there on the ground, and and they're going to clash. Well, I think you could call that a shotgun wedding. The old Taylor Grazing Act had some requirements, but in trying to balance those requirements into the single uses that we also had mandate, it became very difficult for the field manager to actually uh, balance those uses and have a legal basis for balancing the uses. It took the focus of the environmental movement of the 60s to bring attention to the dilemma faced by the orphan BLM, responsibility without authority. Recreation was coming into the fore. Uh, other uses of the land. We started practicing kind of a crude form of uh, multiple use. Early leadership came from BLM's second director. Marion Clausen was dedicated to stewardship of the public lands, as were those who immediately followed. We had other resources that should be managed, and there should be some balanced use, and yet we had no, we had no charter, we had no legal right to do this. And many of the things that we did try were, were done in spite of the, the existing regulations and laws. We saw the, the wildlife program created, we saw recreation created by the budget process, not, not by any, any enabling act, but, but through the budget process. Forestry got a shot in the arm, realty programs were, were being decentralized out to the districts. Uh, it was a very exciting time. Congress at this time saw the need to resolve the question of disposal of public lands. In 1964 came the Classification and Multiple Use Act. The act mandated the classification of public lands into categories for retention, disposal, and further study for the Public Land Law Review Commission. Although the law only had a five-year lifespan, it did provide for multiple use management on the public lands. But in 1970, when it expired, BLM was left in the lurch. It became evident to me that, one, we had a, we had a, a great role in, in the stewardship of our natural resources, but our pattern of ownership was so scattered, so broken, and we were concerned only with the surface management. The 60s also launched us on the course of systematic land use planning, first for watersheds, then under planner Bob Jones, the Unit Resource Analysis Management Framework Plan, or MFP. But unfortunately, that planning system was almost entirely based on the surface pattern of ownership and the surface resources. In my opinion, we just completely disregarded the mineral resource. Then, in 1969, at the end of a decade of growing awareness of environmental concerns in America, Congress passed the National Environmental Policy Act, or NEPA. It was a broad law with no specific language that would single out the public lands, yet its impact on BLM would equal that of the Taylor Grazing Act. BLM, I think, uh, thought they were going to be able to, to go blissfully down the road business as usual, but uh, it's kind of like the shot that was heard around the world. Uh, really about the middle of the 70s, we, had, we suffered some serious reversals. I think the environmental movement started out pretty well, but because of the strengths and the powers they were able to develop and the influence they had on, the, on uh, Congress, <clears throat> we, we started developing some excesses. Uh, the first crack out of the box, uh, BLM tackled the, the requirement that we do environmental impact statements on, on major actions by doing programmatic kinds of EISs uh, on range, watershed, uh, uh, forestry, et cetera, et cetera. Coal, coal must have had uh, three or four programmatics tried. Uh, because of the, the lack of detail in the law, what happened was uh, very similar to the 1872 Mining Act. Uh, we ended up being litigated. So we developed a, a setup where our decisions were driven by litigation. We were taken to court, and it was the lawyers and the judges who were making our professional decisions. In the early years under NEPA, 
the Bureau found itself in an untenable position. In many cases, an environmental impact statement might point to an environmentally preferred course of action for which the Bureau had no authority to take. We were not legally a multiple use agency. We had the accountability, but we lacked the authority to take action. We had some really tough impacts on people because we, we did bring people together for six weeks details which went on and on and on beyond six weeks. Uh, it was really tough on, on people and families. We, we rode them hard and put them up wet, <laughs> as the saying goes. But I, I think that the, the upshot of the National Environmental Policy Act, the one, the one that really uh, put her back to the wall was the, the lawsuit that was initiated by the Natural Resources Defense Council on the grazing program. NRDC challenged the programmatic and, and the upshot was that the courts ordered, ordered us to do 212 EISs on, on fairly large tracts of uh, public lands. The NRDC suit had the Bureau in a quandary. First efforts at site-specific environmental assessment of individual allotments bogged down. Inventory data was backlogged at our computers. So the upshot uh, was that that EIS ends up being a new adjudication. While regional EISs were being developed, the BLM was sued by livestock grazing interests. An injunction prevented our making full force and effect cuts in grazing use. We have an intermingled land pattern. Uh, pretty hard to order somebody off of, off of our land and it's not even fenced and his is there. A compromise position was struck to no one's satisfaction. Range conditions and trend would be monitored for a period extending to five years following completion of the EIS. Our critics took a hide and watch position. The coal resource program was subjected to similar pressures and excesses. Shifting signals in the area of NEPA compliance were complicated by radical fluctuations in supply and demand in the energy industry. Policy changed almost overnight, and litigation was commonplace. We're getting beat around the head and the shoulders for, for things that uh, we knew were correct, we knew we should be doing them, but we really didn't have the authorization except a, an annual budget that appropriated money to, to do watershed things, wildlife things, uh, as well as grazing, which was really the, the main mandate that in the, the forestry program. Out of the environmental movement, our Organic Act finally came. The Federal Land Policy and Management Act, or FLIPMA, was passed on the eve of President Carter's election in 1976. With the passage of FLIPMA, we clearly had not only the authority to take action, but an absolute accountability and responsibility to take those actions that, that were laid out for us. Uh, in, in a, a balanced means. A new land use planning system was designed to implement the mandates of FLIPMA. The Resource Management Plan, or RMP, melded planning with the environmental requirements of NEPA into a single decision-making process. Full public participation was provided throughout the process, and internally, tunnel vision single resource planning was replaced with an interdisciplinary teamwork approach to issues and problem solving. America is starting to realize that uh, we've been on a, a binge. We haven't recognized some of the things we should have, particularly where the resources are concerned. I thought it was too bad that we, in fact, almost a crime that we ended up being sued, so forth. We were at a stage where we could have pushed that range program ahead uh, by leaps and bounds, and uh, then we get sued, and I think we got set back 30 or 40 years in, in bringing the, the, that soil vegetation resource 
uh, up to its full potential. Uh, I saw some, a great development of expertise in the Bureau then, the late 60s and the early 70s from the standpoint of bringing in a lot of exotic, to, to us, exotic skills. So we got the economists, we got, we even had psychologists, and we began to interface with the public, I think, a lot better than we had before. 1969, the bulk of our people were either foresters, range managers, wildlife biologists, or realty specialists, plus the support activities in fire, cadastral administration, so forth. By 1976, we, we had picked up, uh, based on my head count at the, the cauldron that year, uh, we had 56 skills represented down there. We had every ologist that's known to man almost on the rolls in BLM. Among the provisions in FLIPMA were those for wilderness inventory and recommendations to Congress. A controversial program from the start, wilderness inventory was operated largely by new hires under headquarters program direction. Many line managers felt that management direction was not properly utilized to temper the program. Put your, yourself in the, the shoes of the, the rancher or the miner out there and, and uh, the word wilderness will strike the, the fear of God in your heart. We have uh, the re-adjudication of the, the vegetation as a result of the EIS. We have the wilderness situation. Uh, we have uh, all of the new skills coming on board and they're all out there working their thing out on the public lands and, and uh, by the time that Ronald Reagan come into office then there was a tremendous groundswell coming out of the West that says uh, things are out here on the public lands are going to hell in a handbasket and we want it stopped and we're we're, uh, we're going to rebel. Soon after the passage of FLIPMA, ranchers, fearful of the Bureau of Land Management's new mandate to retain and administer the public lands for multiple resource purposes, turned to the idea of selling the public lands to private individuals or turning the lands over to the states. Starting in Nevada, the movement spread across the West. It became known as the Sagebrush Rebellion. NEPA triggered off the NRDC suit that led to the round of environmental impact statements, which in turn forced a re-adjudication of the range. This brought forth a violent reaction from the ranchers and their support groups. Well, the Sagebrush Rebellion, as I know it, is uh, <clears throat> simply a, uh, a concern from the using public, uh, and especially the, the livestock industry, with uh, having to accept uh, bureaucratic mandates on public land that they use as a part of their operations. And um, they being a very independent sort of people uh, prefer not to have to answer to anyone with regard to their management decisions. Uh, simply put, they would prefer to own that land and it was an initiative that was designed to first of all, to acquire those lands uh, for private ownership. That didn't uh, wash simply because of the immense capital uh, requirements that were uh, involved. And then it was modified to um, mean instead a conveyance of these federal land estates to the states. Congress had no intention of relinquishing federal ownership of the public lands. The administration, however, saw the public lands as an asset that could be possibly used to help balance the national debt. The policy became known as the Asset Management Program. The Asset Management Program met with much resistance from other user groups and environmentalists. The administration then turned their thoughts to the idea of land ownership adjustment, with the idea of repositioning federal lands to enhance public resource values. One of the uh, positions of most uh, people that are involved in land and resource management is, is that these things are a, a national uh, treasure that uh, dollars cannot be put on. 
and that as time goes on, more and more resource values and ultimately uh, uh, values to the public will uh, emanate from this land resource. Land tenure adjustment or repositioning has become an important multiple use management tool. Before we invest in our future, first we must secure title to our nation's treasure house. We must position ourselves in the lands which best can serve the long-term benefits of the American people. Some lands can be developed to their highest and best use in private ownership, state ownership, or under other government agencies. Other lands should be retained in public ownership for multiple use. Well, the idea is essentially that uh, the public lands, uh, before investment can be made in them, need to be protected so that they cannot be uh, taken for uh, purposes that would be inconsistent with the investment that's out there. In the early 80s, BLM's mineral responsibilities were strengthened. Onshore inspection and enforcement came from the U.S. Geological Survey. Mineral classification and appraisal functions also were added. But we're beginning to realize now that uh, this is it. A nation that doesn't take care of its resources adequately no longer maintains its position worldwide. Someone has to pay the piper, and now we're ready to do that. But that means that you're going to have to have some skilled, dedicated people to step in and start moving this thing, getting that train back on the track. And resources can't be ignored. That's everyone's right, not only our right, but our kids' rights and, our, and their kids. And, uh, and it's not going to be settled politically. It's going to be settled by wise management on the ground level. Multiple-use lands need to be secured and consolidated for efficiency and for conservation in the truest sense, management for the long-term good of the American public. As you can see, the Bureau of Land Management has a unique challenge. We have responsibilities for the remnants of the once vast public domain, a treasure trove of resources that must be managed for this generation and generations to follow. 